Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS at Windows 95 days. And today, I'm going to convince you that your password security is weak sauce and that it's time to do something about it before it all goes wrong. Because the reality is that if you're anything like 90% of the people that I know, you reuse some passwords in multiple places and you have passwords that contain things like pet names and dates and English words. Maybe you think adding an exclamation mark to the end will fool the hackers, but it won't. About 30 years ago, I moved to Seattle and one of the things I did at first upon moving was to set up a new bank account. Naturally, I then had to pick a PIN code for my new ATM card, which I did, and I then dutifully remembered it without writing it down for the next 20 or so years. And that's when I realized something. The ATM code that I had picked was the same as the last four digits of my phone number and had been for 20 years. The ATM code predates the phone number by at least a year, so it's a total coincidence with a chance of about 1 in 10,000, and somehow I just never noticed. I picked the code because I could remember that 1939 was the year that World War II started, and the phone number was randomly assigned. And I guess now you know my old ATM code and the last four digits of my phone number. If you figure out the rest, give yourself a big pat on the back, but please don't call me to tell me about it. I don't know you. Who is this? Don't come here. I'm hanging up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. ATM codes can be short because they're effectively two-factor authentication. They require that the physical card be present. But with a website, you don't have that luxury. And that's the reason why web passwords need to be much longer. But how long and complex do they actually need to be to be safe? Well, let's say you have a 10-digit alphanumeric password. Specifically, we'll go with Banana 1492, something that might at first feel like it's long enough to feel reasonably secure, and it's a mix of numbers and letters, and so on. But is it safe? Let's have a look. With repetition allowed, while there are some 308 million possible permutations of six letters, there are far fewer proper English words that have six letters. In fact, with only about 40,000 words in common usage at all, it's a fairly safe bet to assume there are maybe around 5,000 six-letter words at best. Now, of course, we have those four digits on the end, too, so that's got to make things a lot harder to crack, right? And it does, of course, but not as much as you'd think. You might notice first off that 1492 is the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So our numeric portion wasn't completely random even to begin with. But even if it were, that's only a factor of 10,000. So if we have 5,000 possible words multiplied by 10,000 possible numbers, well, that sounds big, but that's still only 50 million combinations. Call it 100 million if you want to try throwing that exclamation mark on the end, like a lot of people do. So how long does it take a modern processor to hash a 10-digit password like this with 100 million possibilities? Well, on a modern CPU, on just a single core, it can do about a billion MD5 hashes per second. Up to security to SHA-256, and it makes it 10 times as hard with maybe 100 million hashes per second. Now, wait a minute. We said there were 100 million possible passwords and that this type of password can be sampled and hashed at a rate of about 100 million a second. So obviously, it would only take about one second to break this password. Clearly, the days of just combining your old dog's name with the street address you grew up on is no longer tenable. So what's the right approach? And that's the problem. Because the right approach is to use more than 10 digits, if at all possible, and to make them a much better mix of randomly uppercase and lowercase letters, not spell any words, and ideally scatter some punctuation around inside of it as well. And if you could do that, then do it pretty randomly, and there's one case where you should, then you'd be largely safe for that single login. So what's the problem with that? Well, if you have 50 logins, there's no way you're going to remember more than a couple of these extra complex codes unless you're Rain Man. And I'm halfway there and I can't do it, so what shot have you got? Now, if you're okay with carrying around a little spiral-wound notebook of your 50 complex passwords, of course with an obligatory Bic pen, you can probably make do with that as a system. Unless, of course, your little notebook were lost or stolen. And given that it contains every password you use, it could be a catastrophic loss. It almost sounds like there should be an app for that, and so you can see where we're going. So let's imagine for a second that you move your master password list file from the little book to a little vault app on your phone. You could even encrypt the list with one complex master password so that you had two layers of protection. First, you'd have to log into the phone and then enter the master password, and then you'd be able to see all of your other passwords. This would be arguably workable if a little annoying and labor intensive. You would have to pull your phone out of your pocket every time you needed to know one of your logins and there's a chance that you type them wrong given their random collections of garbage numbers and digits. Pretty soon you can see that while the solution is technically feasible, nobody would want to use it. But what if the list wasn't encrypted on our phone in our pocket, but instead encrypted on our PC within the web browser itself? Presuming it was secure, it would then have direct access to the browser, and you know what's going to happen next. Autofill. 
The little password app lives in the browser, so when it sees a form asking for an account that it knows, it can offer to fill in the form for you automatically. You still have to remember the one master password, but once you've provided that, it will fill the forms automatically for you. Once you've become accustomed to it, it's one of the great luxuries of modern life, to be honest. I log into my password manager once, and then when I visit any site that needs a password, which is long, complex, and unbreakable, one is provided by the password manager. It's not something you'd want to type, but the browser doesn't mind doing it, and will dutifully fill in the forms on any matching site. When you sign up for a new account somewhere, you get the password manager to generate and remember a secure, complex password for you, and it goes into the form. So you don't even type it the very first time. Now, if you're at all like me, this might all sound well and good, but there are two things probably giving you the willies a little bit. And the first thing is the notion that it blindly pokes your password into web forms. Well, rest assured, it's not that naive. You see, a good password manager will not only store your passwords securely, but also associate each password with the specific website's URL. So when you visit a login page, the password manager checks to see if the domain of the website matches the one that it's expecting. And if the SSL certificate doesn't match, for example, if you're on google.com instead of google.com, the password manager will not autofill your credentials no matter how much it looks like the real deal. This alone protects you from a whole class of phishing attacks where malicious sites are made to look almost exactly like legitimate ones to trick you into giving away your password. You've probably got a relative or two who would benefit from this type of thing as well. In addition to this, password managers can generate strong, unique passwords for every site you visit and it'd be different than every one. That means if one of your passwords gets compromised, the damage is contained to just that one site. Think of it as having a different key for every lock in your life, and even if one key is lost or stolen, it won't get the thief into every door that you own. Then you lock that giant key ring in a bulletproof briefcase with a big lock on it, and you only ever have to worry about the one key. And there's another benefit. Password managers can remind you to change weak or reused passwords, or even flag when your credentials have been part of a data breach by cross-referencing them against known databases of leaked accounts. It's a little creepy hearing that your specific password was leaked, even if it wasn't associated with your account. But if two people in the world are using the same password, even without knowing it, it means that that password is too easy to be secure. A complex password will have enough entropy to be pretty much unique across space and time. Beyond the basic benefits of storing and autofilling passwords, password managers offer several additional advantages that go a long way towards enhancing your online security, privacy, and convenience. Think of them as little life hacks that take a little setup and then pay off big dividends. First, a password manager can drastically reduce the cognitive load of managing multiple accounts. Without one, you're likely juggling dozens, if not hundreds, of username and passwords. A password manager does the heavy lifting by generating, storing, and automatically filling in complex, unique passwords for every site that you visit. As I said, you only need to remember the one password, freeing your brain to focus on more meaningful tasks and ideally use a more complex password for that one password. Then there's the benefit of cross-device synchronization. Most password managers work seamlessly across multiple platforms, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iOS, Android, and so on. This synchronization means that whether you're on your desktop at home or on your phone while out and about or while traveling with your tablet, your passwords are always at your fingertips, securely synced and up to date. On the iPhone, it can even fill based on Face ID, a very handy feature. Password managers also help mitigate the risks associated with weak security questions. Many websites use security questions like, what's your mother's maiden name or what was your first pet's name? These are often easy to guess or find out with a little bit of social engineering. A password manager can store fake answers, as complex as weird as you want them to be for these questions, making it significantly harder for an attacker to guess. And since it remembers all these unique answers, you don't have to. For argument's sake, let's say you're convinced. You've decided to use a password manager. Great choice. But your next question is no doubt which one. And I was going to beg off with it being a matter of personal choice, and it ultimately doesn't matter which one you use as long as you use one. But it does. I'm the fourth generation to have worked at our family hardware store down on the corner, but this is one of those times that it makes sense to go to the big box store. And so while I used RoboForm for over a decade myself and then used the Apple one for a while, I ultimately settled on the password manager built into Chrome. And I recommend either using the one built into Edge or Chrome, the major browsers. And my reasons are pretty simple. First, I figure companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft have so much at stake when it comes to safeguarding billions of passwords that they'll make the technological investments needed to secure them. Second, if there is ever a leak, that's going to be a big enough deal that it'll be on the news, so I'll know about it right away. 
And third, if they do leak passwords, mine will then just be noise among the other billions of passwords. Maybe it's a scorched earth view of security, but it lets me sleep at night. Now, the other thing that gave me the willies about password managers was who actually had access to my secret garden of plentiful passwords. Could some nerd at Google just access my passwords given admin rights on their local system? Or what if the whole thing gets hacked? Well, these are all valid questions. After all, you are handing over the keys to your digital life. Your bank accounts, email, social media, maybe even your Facebook account. By the way, follow me on Facebook for pretty much daily shenanigans that don't make it into the episodes. My link is in the video description. But now let's dive into this a little bit deeper. Let's imagine for a moment that you've entrusted Google Chrome's built-in password manager to store all of your login credentials. Every time you visit a new website, Chrome conveniently offers to generate a password for you when it's a new account or to save the password you type in for you. And from then on, it's just a click away from logging in. Sounds great, but what's actually happening behind the scenes? Well, when you save a password in Chrome, it's encrypted right there on your device before it ever leaves to go to Google servers. They use something called AES, or the Advanced Encryption Standard, with a 256-bit key. Now, without getting too technical, what this means is that your passwords are locked up tight, and that they're using a method so secure that even the world's most powerful supercomputers would struggle to crack it. So far, so good. But here's where it gets interesting. You might be thinking, sure, it's encrypted, but doesn't that mean that Google could decrypt it if they wanted to? And that's the beauty of something called a zero-knowledge approach. With a zero-knowledge architecture, Google doesn't actually know your passwords. The key needed to unlock that encryption, the master key, if you will, never leaves your device. That means that even if a Google employee had access to their servers with raw abandon, they'd still be staring at a bunch of gibberish without the master key to unlock it. And remember, they don't have that key. Only you and your machine have it. Of course, this doesn't mean that we should just take a big drag, chill out, and trust everything implicitly. Even if Google can't access your passwords, their servers still could be a target. After all, Google is one of the biggest tech companies in the world, which makes them a pretty attractive target for hackers. But here's the catch. Because your passwords are encrypted with a key that only you have, even if an attacker somehow managed to breach Google's defenses and access the password database, they would still only get the encrypted data. And decrypting that data without the key? Well, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So does that mean we're in the clear? Well, not quite yet, because there's still the question of your own Google account. Your Chrome password manager is tied directly to your Google account. If your Google account gets compromised, maybe through a phishing attack, a reused password on some other website, or simply a momentary lapse in judgment, that attacker would have access to all the passwords stored in Chrome. And that's why securing your Google account is absolutely vital. And that's the most times I said Google without screwing it up. Think of it this way. Your Google account... <laughs> Think of it this way. Your Google account is like the front door to your digital house. You wouldn't just lock the windows and leave the front door open, right? Well, the same goes for your internet security. You need a strong, unique password for your Google account. Not the name of your first pet or your favorite sports team or something like that. Something complex and unique. And here's the thing. You really need to enable two-factor authentication. It's an extra layer of security that requires something that you know, your password, and something that you have, like a code sent to your physical phone. It's like adding a second lock to that front door or a card to an ATM machine, and it's one that can't be picked as easily. Now, maybe you're thinking, all right, so Google may not be able to see my passwords, but what about other risks like extensions or browser exploits? Well, that's a fair point, because Chrome is a browser, not a dedicated security app. It's designed to be a bit of a Swiss army knife for the web, and with that comes some added risk. A malicious extension or browser vulnerability could potentially expose your data. But let's put that in perspective. If you keep Chrome updated regularly and use only trusted extensions, you're already reducing those risks significantly. And here's where a dedicated password manager like RoboForm or 1Password or Bitwarden might even have a slight edge in a way. They are built from the ground up to handle only the one job, keeping your password safe. It's like comparing a toolbox to a single finely tuned hammer. Sometimes you just need the right tool for the job. But there's more. Have you ever wondered what happens when you need to share a password securely, say with a spouse or a person at work or a friend? Well, maybe the person at work is a friend, I don't know. A good password manager makes that a breeze. Instead of sending sensitive information over an insecure method like email or text, these tools can encrypt the credentials and share them directly with the intended person. And if you ever need to revoke access, you can do that with a single click. No more scrambling to change a dozen passwords when somebody leaves the team. Now, some password managers, including Chrome, even go a step further with features like dark web monitoring. They scan and keep an eye out for your credentials appearing in known data breaches. 
If your password gets leaked, they'll alert you, often before any damage is done, giving you a chance to change it before it's too late. So where does this leave us? Is it safe to use a password manager like Chrome? In short, yes, provided that you use it wisely. Google's security practices from end-to-end -end encryption to zero-knowledge storage are pretty robust. The real risk lies not so much in their system, but in your own security hygiene. Make sure your Google account is fortified with strong passwords and two-factor authentication. Regularly review your security settings, check for unauthorized devices, and stay vigilant. And if you're looking for that extra layer of peace of mind, consider a dedicated password manager built specifically for this purpose. And think how much they would have paid to be the sponsor of this episode. I will. Ultimately, a password manager is a powerful tool that can make your online life far more secure and convenient, but like any tool, it depends on how you use it. Trust, but verify. And remember, in the world of digital security, a little paranoia can go a long way to keeping you safe, so trust your instincts. If you found today's episode to be any combination of informative or entertaining, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like on the video. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. And if you're a regular viewer who hasn't bothered to subscribe because subscriptions don't matter, remember, they matter to me. If you or someone you know might be on the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my new book on Amazon, The Non-Visible Part of the Autism Spectrum. It's intended for folks that don't have a diagnosis, but who suspect they might have a few traits that place them somewhere on the autism spectrum. It's everything I know now about living a successful life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.